this a difficult decision for you? Um, yeah, it was a difficult decision. Um, uh, I, it's been an adventure, um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things that that we've been working on: diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, now the Title IX work to improve the way that we handle Title IX cases, um, and so that that it's exciting work, it's important work, and so that sort of pulled in. You know, I want to keep going. I want to keep doing this. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a teacher. Um, this is the longest period in my professional life that I have not been in a classroom. Um, I, I got into this because of teaching. I got into this because of students. So I really miss students and I really miss being in the classroom. And then we, our first grandchild was born in February of 2020, February 15th. Um, and we were with him his first week of life. And he was tiny, four pounds, four ounces at birth. Um, then we came home on really on Mardi Gras weekend and COVID hit. So we didn't see him in person again until about two and a half weeks ago. And I'll tell you, it was just like, okay, I, I, I got to figure out what in life matters at this point. And I know if, if, if I were permanent president, despite my good intentions, I would see Gilbert, our grandson, less. I would see my kids less. They're not in Louisiana. So I just thought it's, it's time. It's time for me to go back to teaching and spend more time with the family. What about teaching is it that you love so much? Gosh, I, I mean, it's just, I, it's hard to describe. I mean, it, it, it's exciting to, to not just share knowledge, but to get students to, to read and to think, uh, to think for themselves. And, and I've said, if, if a class is going right, it's, it's timeless. I mean, it's like, it, it, you're, nobody's bored, we're all excited, we're all in it together. Um, so there's a little performance about it, but uh, I, I just think it's the give and take and the learning and, and, and the exchange. Now this has been a wild year, year and a half. You've been involved in a lot. What is the impact that you hope that the students got from you and your presence here on campus? Well, and, and you know, the impact's not just mine. I mean, it's a team. It's a, it's a team of, of faculty, staff, and administrators. But I, I hope that the students felt that even if we didn't always agree on everything, that I was present, um, even in COVID, that I listened to them, um, and that first and foremost, we care about their experience. There, there would be no LSU without those students. So they are the most important thing. And, and, and I hope that they, they experienced a little bit of that feeling from this administration. Now some of the things that you have addressed have been massive, you know, national stories. <laughs> Um, how, I mean, how difficult was that for you to have to handle something that you maybe weren't even, you know, here for or knew knowledge of until you got into this position? Yeah, um, and, and we have dealt with, so, so the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, um, I would say certainly there were challenges but we just did the right thing. We did what we thought was the right thing for our students and for LSU. Um, and so we were, we were responsible for how this campus responded to what our students were saying. So while, while that was challenging at times, I, in many ways that was, it was easy and it was very rewarding because the students, the faculty and the staff, I think, and the board kind of came together around those issues and continue to work on them. The hazing issues that we've dealt with um, ha have, have been tragic uh, and so really, really hard. Um, and then the Title IX issues, I think you mentioned, you kind of feel like, well, wait a second, I wasn't here, so, but I'm in the chair. So, so being in the chair, I've got to be the one who apologizes and we continue to apologize to the survivors and we thank them for coming forward. Um, and I've also got to be the one to say, we got to get this right. We've, we've got to be resolute in our work to improve the situation at LSU and to, to make us a leader. So, so Abby, certainly there, it's, there's been times when it's been really stressful. Um, there's been times when it's been hard, uh, but if we do the things that, that we should do, 
uh, the rewards outweigh the stress and the rewards outweigh the difficulty. And I know that must have been a heavy burden to bear. I mean, I, I was there at those Senate committee meetings. Yeah, yeah. It was very emotional. It's very, I mean, I can't imagine taking that on when you weren't necessarily a part of it. Well, and I appreciate that. Um, and it, it was, it's very hard. Um, but I would, again, I would say, while I personally wasn't a part of it, LSU was a part of it. And so in, early on in my career as a dean at the University of Tennessee, I, I realized that sometimes you, you got to separate yourself and your personal feelings. Like, I, I didn't do this. Don't blame me. And you got to realize I'm, I'm the personification of the institution right now. So I've got to take this on, I've got to own it, and I've, I've got to apologize, and I've got to make it right. So, so while it was hard, I mean, that's the role. Moving forward with the Title IX situation, do you feel like you have set a foundation moving forward that the university is going in the right direction? Yeah, I think that's a great word. Um, I think we are literally building the foundation for a strong Title IX office. Uh, creating the Office of Civil Rights in Title IX and moving it out of General Counsel's office was the first important step. I think as we're speaking right now, we're interviewing people for some of the positions that we need to fill. Administrative support, case manager, and investigators. So we are building the foundation for that. Um, we build the foundation, then we build the building on top of the foundation, and hopefully that building is, is part of the way in which we build trust with our community and we become a leader in Title IX compliance. And people look at LSU and say, they're, they're getting it right and they're, they're doing it well. And um, what would you say to the next president that's going to fill your role? I would say you, you got some challenges, um, but this is a great university. Uh, it's a great university with great people. The level of collaboration right now on the flagship w amongst the colleges is, is greater than it's ever been before. The collaboration with the whole LSU family is greater than it's ever been before. The academic emphasis uh, that we have now, I started here in 1986. In I, I, 1998, I left and wandered in the field for 18 years and came back. But from 86 to now, I, I don't think we've ever had su such a powerful emphasis on academics, on research, and on the student experience. Student recruitment, three years in a row, we've set records in terms of the, the size of the entering class and the diversity of the entering class. We're looking, hopefully, at setting a fourth year in a row record. Retention rates higher than it's ever been. Graduation rates higher than it's ever been. So whoever comes next, I would say, you got a great team, you got a great university. Um, we, we built, I'll use your word again, we built the foundations um, to, to deal with some of our challenges. It's a great job, enjoy it, do great things. And um, there is something I wanna ask about and feel free if you don't feel comfortable yeah. answering. I was there during one of the Senate committee hearings whenever you said that you have a daughter that passed away mm -hmm. from cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, can you tell me about did that go into your decision at all when you say that you really looked at what matters? Yeah, yes it did. Um, her name is Ashling, and that's a Gaelic name that means uh, dream or vision. She our, was our third child. She's our middle daughter. We have one son, three daughters. And she was in her second year in medical school at Brown University when she got diagnosed with a really aggressive, rare form of, of non-small cell lung cancer. Um, October of 2018 and she battled it like crazy for 10 months and she passed away in August of 2019. Um, and so the family during that 10 month period, our son was coming from California, our daughter in Nashville and her fiance, later husband, moved, ba they basically moved to Rhode Island where Ashley was. My wife basically moved to Rhode Island. I was going up every weekend. Um, our daughter Sarah in New Hampshire and her husband Jeremiah were coming down. We have a couple of surrogate sons from Nepal, um, Prithal and Depes, and they were, so we were all together. Um, and then she passed away, and we all kind of went back, 
and came together again at Thanksgiving and Christmas that year. So we were still processing that loss, as we always will be, um, when I took over this job. And it really, I think, helped me to kind of deal with the grief and like, look, I have this thing to do. But then COVID hit. And so we're apart again. And so I think as, as we're coming out of COVID and we're able to be together, it, it's almost like the family has to come back together. So, it, so, so that factored into it too. Um, and as I said, Abby, you'll never finish the grieving process, but I do think it, it's time for me to kind of get, get back to that part of it as well. Yeah, that's a lot to deal with. I had no idea yeah. until you said that at that meeting that you were also dealing with that while dealing with these huge things at LSU. Um, I mean, how did you, how did you handle all of that? I mean, I know that sounds like a really big Well, I, 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 no. It's just amazing that not, you. I don't think it's amazing. I think there's two things. Is one is um, I'm surrounded by great people. Um, my wife Susan is absolutely fantastic, and uh, I, I learned early on that the best way to deal with stuff is to just put one foot in front of the other one. Um, and I'm really lucky because for some reason uh, I was born with this well of enthusiasm um, that I don't know how I tap into it, but that that it's in there so I, I tapped in I tapped into it and put one foot in front of the other one and all these wonderful people at LSU and my wife and family just kept propping me up along the way and let's talk about your grandbaby Gilbert. yes Gilbert <laughs> um, I mean what did you, you said that that also factored into your decision kind of tell me more about that yeah that totally factored into the decision we spent uh, 13 months with him on FaceTime um, and thank God for FaceTime, but we didn't see him in person. And uh, so we have a condo in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, because we, we spent 10 years in New Hampshire, and we kept the condo. And so we went up there, um, and our son and his girlfriend came from California. We're all vaccinated. And we were there a couple days early, and Sarah and Jeremiah brought Gilbert into the condo. And so we've never seen him in person except when he's four pounds, four ounces. And you know, with small children, you would expect, we expected he'd be shy, he wouldn't know who we were. And he comes in and there's this little boy, you know, with his father carrying him and he's just sort of beaming. You know, he's looking around and he's like, I'm Gilbert and, you know, I don't know if he recognized this or not, but we thought he did. And it was just like, you know, it was sort of glow city. Um, and, you know, while he's a tiny kid, he cries in there, but totally good-natured child. I mean, we had an absolutely wonderful long weekend and then another long weekend with him later on. So um, our only grandchild, our first grandchild, and, you know, we want, I want to spend more time with him. Do you leave this position feeling fulfilled that you did a lot? Well, I feel, yes. I feel I've been through a lot. I would say we did a lot. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's always more work to be done. S so er er early in my career, I watched some folks who said, well, I'm going to stay a little bit longer till I finish the job. But so there's always more work to be done. So you can't think it's done. I mean, there are things that, that, boy, I would like to be around for the finish, but, but I, I feel we've put things in a, in as good a place as we possibly could. Um, I think that LSU is looking great to move forward. So yeah, I, I feel fulfilled. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I was thinking about this over the past month, and as the deadline got closer, it became much more real. So last Friday, I think I had pretty much made up my decision, um, but I still wasn't for sure. Sunday morning, I, I said, Susan, I'm not going to be in the pool anymore, and you want a bagel? Yes. So I got in the car to go to New York Bagel, and I realized, like, my shoulders were more relaxed than they've been in about a year. You know, my back was limber, so I'm fulfilled, and I made the right decision. And my last question for you, um, there's been a lot of criticism along the way. Um, what would you say to someone who doesn't know you except for seeing you, at these, seeing you as the face of these things that have happened? What would you say to them? Mm, I'm not sure what I would say to them. Um, I, I think um, that uh, 
a, a part of me, I would say I've done the best I could. Um, and, and so I've, I've done the best I've done the best I could. Um, the, the, a side of me wants to say one of the things I learned is I've read some things that I think to myself, wow, they just really don't know me very well at all. Um, but other than that, I would say I've done the best I could.